The culture is actually damn good. You got fire in your gut? The culture uh, in our building is outstanding. I'm hoping all of you. Welcome to Sportsball, proudly sponsored this week by Raycon. I've spoken many a time about their everyday earbuds and everyday headphones, offering premium sound and seamless Bluetooth capabilities at roughly half the price of major brands. If it's a cold day outside and I need to procrastinate on a crap ton of work to do, you know it's time for Raycons and chill. They're always a staple of my audio diet. But what you may not know is that Raycon offers other quality tech items for daily life. Premium water filters, air purifiers, 180 degree universal charging cables, and much more. Like their earbuds and headphones, they're offered at a very competitive price. And don't forget that December's just around the corner. You might be wondering what you could get that's both practical and cost effective as a present. Why not Raycons? The savings will get even better as you can get an early start on holiday sales by shopping Raycon's early Black Friday sale today. Go to buyraycon.com slash utree to get 20 to 50% off site-wide. A special time of the year is coming, and with Raycons, the world is your oyster. Don't know if it's the same about sports ball, though. What franchise with concerning issues will pull through on Thursday Night Football? The Buccaneers, who are jammed in neutral on offense and unable to move? Or the Bills, with offensive struggles of their own as well as injury woes? The solution to this dilemma? Home cooking. In Buffalo, Josh Allen returned to Atlas holding up the earth on offense. It was a solid bounce back game, minus the deflection interception that tied the game up. And having to go into the blue tent for a hot minute, thank god he's okay. But anything Josh did was equaled by the defense. Constantly pinned near their own end zone by excellent punting. Baker and company eaten alive by a thousand tiny bites. The offensive woes for Tampa linger on. Simply because they were in a full Nelson for most of the damn game. The Bills were burying their opponent alive. Yet whenever they tried to shovel the dirt back in, they kept falling in the damn hole. A prolonged and incredibly frustrating Bucks touchdown drive had them within one score. This is miserable enough, I'll save you the trouble Buffalo won the game. Tampa's now lost their third in a row. And things are getting quite concerning on their front. Kind of like the final pass. Is anyone gonna bother to get near that Hail Mary? It's a football, not a hand grenade. At least Buffalo was able to try and patch up one issue on their defense. Replacing Tredavious White is all but impossible, but the answers within are suboptimal. Kair Elam, how do we put this nicely? Fucking sucks. He's a turnstile at corner. And he hasn't been a healthy scratch for no reason whatsoever. They need an answer that can fill in as a starter and be a leader in the locker room. Good for them, Green Bay is also a mess. And Rasul Douglas is available for the taking. He can't be super picky with deadline deals, but he'll be good enough. The Bills didn't have to pay that much anyway. What they really need is mutant healing for Matt Milano, but I don't think that's gonna be happening. The Los Angeles Rams are like that mystery toy you sent for with cereal box UPCs. It could be something cool like Chex Quest. Most of the time it's just some shitty trinket that lasts as long as they did against the Cowboys. This analogy had more life than the Rams getting no. Dallas. LA became glorified enhancement talent in a squash match. They're there to put the Cowboys over, and that's it. Dak Prescott and the defense went out there and piped them. Crushed in all facets before the first half was even over. Even in the blood cost, the Rams can have no solace. Matthew Stafford was pulled with a thumb injury, and the team dies with him. Jerry Boy will be patiently sitting by his phone in case you want to give him any players before the deadline. Remember, he won't call you. You have to call him. His defense will vet your inquiry. Home game against the Patriots, automatic win for the Dolphins. The hoodie and his empire must travel to the harsh environments of Miami, it's already over. They may as well be done in Endor fighting against Ewoks. Bring out the ATATs and then fall to primitive traps to go one for nine on third down. Despite having the early advantage. This is the New England way. Have some momentum, push the ball deep in Miami territory, and then Mac forces a terrible pass right to Jalen Ramsey. Wait, Jalen Ramsey's back? thought he was supposed to be out until mid-December. The football world is full of mystery. Like how the Patriots continually frustrate everyone in their fandom with their repeated tripping on landmines. Miami did well, but once again, until they can beat a legit contender, there will always be questions. Just keep grinding these convincing wins out and you'll get another chance. Tennessee has to suffer through watching absolute dog shit at quarterback yet again. 
while Levis is also making his debut in what might be an upgrade. With how awful Ryan over the hill has been, anything is better. Levis imposed his will on a great defense in his debut, and his game plan was simply fuck it DeAndre Hopkins is down there somewhere. Wow, who knew that all you had to do was throw the ball to Nuke Hopkins and you'll be pretty successful? Considering that Levis had four touchdowns on the game more than their passing TD total on the season, it's pretty damning. A lot like watching Desmond Ritter continually fuck the ball over and over and over. Anyone who questions Arthur Smith for his decisions is scoffed and belittled in press conferences. Yet all Desmond does is prove us right with our score. After half, Arthur finally submits. And Ritter is told to ride the pie. What a shocker that Taylor Heineke ran the offense much better once he came in. Totally surprising. Will Levis was the star today, though. He's earned himself another chance. And this win may have salvaged their season in the worst way. Good tribute to the Euler Blues. Even if it feels absolutely haram to do up in Nashville. The battle of the number one and two picks in the draft. CJ Stroud may be showing promise, but Bryce Young has been sent to die in Charlotte. Things are getting a bit dire. And Frank Reich has voluntarily relinquished play calling duties at gunpoint. Considering all we've seen in the mess that Carolina is right now, the Texans should be putting their offense in cruise control and driving to an easy win. However, nothing is ever easy. Regardless of what they attempt, Houston can never shake off the bloodsucker on their body. Self-inflicted wounds and an offense that can't get off the ground most drives gives Carolina a chance only down by one. Their defense is still pretty good though, so it's to be somewhat expected. What isn't expected is Bryce and the Panthers running off a drive at their own nine-yard line. Young flashes the talent that made him a first overall pick, eating up shitloads of clock and holding off the hounds of war for their first win on the year. Wait, the Panthers won. What the hell? Special shout out to Tavier Thomas for committing three straight penalties to win the game. 2008 Lions and 2017 Browns pop the champagne bottles. And no and 17 team will not usurp you this year. Green Bay's gangrenous wounds are starting to fester. Aaron Jones may be back, but the Packers will once again experience something that hasn't been regular since the 80s. Failure. Consistent, pervasive failure. An offense that can't drive, a defense that keeps driving backwards, and a coaching staff asleep at the wheel. There may be pieces of skill, but there is literally nothing here. Nothing. This is a shitty football team. And today's results more than justify such a claim. Here's a consolation prize of Rashawn Gary being extended. Minnesota routed their foe with next to no effort needed whatsoever. A well-rounded win that should be satisfying to everyone in the organization. There's one major problem with this outcome. Vikings, you know finishing within one score of your opponent is the law. You have violated it. Now pay with your blood. <laughs> Kirk Cousins, torn Achilles. This might be the last time he puts on a Vikings uniform. Even in victory, there will be devastating loss. Kirk was putting together some great performances recently, too. What a fucking brutal blow. There isn't much available on the market to replace Cousins. Certainly nothing near his calibers of late. I'd tell them to scramble, but there isn't much available to even do that. Break the glass in case of emergency? Well, this is certainly one. Josh Dobbs is backup caliber, but he's on the outs in Arizona and has proven he can start in a pinch. It's better than what they have, so congratulations, you're a Viking. Josh, you're gonna be thrown into the fire, but hey, it's a starting gig. Good chance to add a little more money to that next contract if you succeed. Hopefully. There comes a time when the endless bullshit must stop. All the fluke occurrences and opponents imploding will not be enough to pull out a win. On a miserable day in Pittsburgh, the Steelers were simply miserable. More offensive ineptitude, despite the endless opportunities handed to them. But all signs did point to a black and gold win. Their opponent repeatedly self-destructing in strange and unusual ways to keep them within a score in the first half. But apparently the football gods have had enough. Ref Ball repeatedly fucks them with terrible penalties to give Jacksonville momentum. Amplifying it, Minka went down with injury. And Kenny Pickett was taken for rapture. Oh my god! They killed Kenny! You bastards! They must rely on kissing the titties to field goal. They get called for offsides on the starting guard? Was he even offsides? Did they ever call that penalty? The second field goal's missed. Momentum officially sacked. Canadian offense remains stereotypically inoffensive for most of the second half, and Jacksonville remains frustratingly inconsistent on offense. 
It's a Pittsburgh kind of football game, yet the Jags are besting them at it. I'd hope for a comeback, but kissing titties is not Kenny Pickett in the clutch. There will only be arm punts to the Hope defense. Not good when it's against the team that equals you in takeaway prowess. In ugly circumstances, Jacksonville pulls away from Steeler bullshit with the dub, and now control their own destiny. Now let's do something about that offensive consistency, please. I'd like to think that all of Saints Nation is holding Pete Carmichael against his will in a rusty old shack on the bayou. With how the offense performed against the Colts, there's no way that this is the same unit that we've seen over the past few weeks. A Saints team that played up to full potential? Are we in an alternate timeline? Brilliant chemistry between Carr and his receivers, a balanced attack, and over 500 yards of a tremendous bounty. Growing to the explosiveness of Rashid Shaheed, that's a fantastic idea! The thing is, the Colts did their best to keep up with the assault, but by the end, it was intercepted to give New Orleans more life. The Saints pull away on the road and win. And it's a much needed one at the end of the day. It slings them right back into contention for the division that should not exist. And we'll probably be yelling at them for the same offensive ineptitude next week. Indianapolis, in the meantime, is simulating the season equivalent of Charlie Brown kicking the football. Jim Irsay mentioned that the NFL told him they fucked up last week which means that Roger's probably going to give him a permanent vacation in a vat of acid. No one one-ups the shield. No one. I don't get the cops. Against some of the worst teams in football, they'll look terrible, but against the Eagles, they suddenly turn into their 1991 vintage. Make it all make sense. The more I think about it, the more I believe the NFL simply trolls us for their entertainment. To begin, Philly looks sluggish and Washington is running in stride up 14-3. They have a chance to kill them off, but fail a fourth and one. Then the commies remember that A.J. Brown is actually an amazing receiver you simply can't guard. And then the Eagles tush push their way deep into Washington territory to start the second half to an easy fumble at the one yard line. Fumbled the brotherly shove? Oh my god in heaven. The game then becomes a fight of offensive power. Washington's inability to capitalize on the fumble leads to more revelations about A.J. Brown being unearthly. The commies respond to it with Faker Mayfield himself leading a touchdown drive. Sam Howell, like his team, somehow becomes an elite QB against Philly. Don't know how, don't care to explain it. I just like it. Same goes for Jalen Hurts on the next drive, simply destroying the Washington secondary like he did the last time they met. And suddenly the game is tied at the hands of Devontae Smith. Sadly for Washington, they can't keep up. Howell's intercepted deep in Washington territory and DeAndre Swift does the rest. Philly would not relinquish this lead. Took a bit to get started, but Philly flexed their might on both sides of the ball. And they'll do it in unique ways, such as touchdowns to Julio Jones. Yeah, he's still in the NFL. Oh, Washington, this was a crucial game for your short-term future, and you just couldn't do anything to stop the inevitable. Now with Minnesota potentially fucked, a hard decision must be made. Push for a wildcard loss as the seventh seed? Or trade your high-profile defensive ends for day two picks? In this critical moment, Washington thought like Belichick on a 4th and 3 at the opposing 40. They punted. Their high-profile edge rushers in Montez Sweat and Chase Young have been sent packing for a pair of Day 2 picks. Montez gets to travel to the Windy City, where he'll be expected to be an immediate impact player on a team with no pass rush. The Bears are trading an early second rounder for him, which will make sense if they extend him long term. Also, if they didn't try to trade Jalen Johnson, but at least he's still here. For now. Chase Young, however, gets the reward of being thrust into a media contention. The rich get richer. San Francisco adds to their incredible defensive glut with another second overall pick. Chase has had injury woes, but with him and Nick Bosa together, if he reaches the level that I think he can, holy shit, that's a D-line that competes with the Eagles. And it only costs them a third. Now, only if that could fix their issues on offense recently. That'd be nice. Still a better situation than Riverboat Ron's in right now. He's just sitting around waiting to be served a pink slip. This was a game. It was one where you wish Bane would just blow up the field to relieve us from the pain of watching it, but you cannot deny that it was played. This might legitimately be one of the worst football games I've seen since last year. A grotesque, deformed monstrosity that should have been euthanized simply so it could no longer feel any sort of pain. It was partially great defense for both sides. And more neither offense unable to understand the core principles of football. All that will be is Brees Hall scampering for a 50-yard passing touchdown. Otherwise, it will be pain. Literal pain when it comes to Tyrod Taylor. 
I ask again, what the hell did he do to earn the constant wrath of the football gods? As the Madden Ambulance runs over three players to take him to the hospital and to the next man up in Tommy DeVito. Who the hell is Tommy DeVito? Is this Danny's kid or the guy from Goodfellas? Ponder this as you yearn for the first down. Anything from either team. There will be nothing but offensive death until the start of the second half. It's here where Saquon puts forth a Herculean effort to will the G-Man to the red zone and its fruits with him. Touchdown, Tommy DeVito. Giants up by three, where it would stay thanks to more awful offense. At least the Jets are trying to throw the ball, but are handicapped by a bad O-line in Zach Wilson. The Giants' defensive unit is stuffing everything in sight, but their offense is suddenly chicken shit. They're setting offense back to days before the forward pass. Even Pop Warner offenses feature more creativity in the attacking game. Guess how many passing yards they had in the day? Negative nine. You and I, sitting on our asses, pondering the patheticness of our existence through for more net yards than the Giants had. And the Jets can do nothing to take advantage. The fourth quarter is winding down. And we yearn for either team to convert a damn third down, but no one can. The Jets can't even convert a fourth down. And the game should be all but over. Sadly, Brian Dable has lost his balls. You have a fourth and one, the Jets have no timeouts left, and you're kicking a field goal? Brother, if you convert the fourth down, you win! Missing the kick is icing on the cake. The logic itself deserves to be scored. And then the defense self-destructs. Long pass by Wilson and offsides on the Giants, which stops the clock. Then Zach Wilson suddenly adds more offense with another long pass, and the agony must continue. Because a terrible game deserves terrible overtime. Don't worry, the Giants can't do anything, but they try to throw the ball, which is shocking in and of itself. Do we really trust Zach Wilson to repeat what he did on the last drive? The Giants do more than enough on their own. Please, old yeller, this game. Kick on the way, and it is good! And they nearly missed that kick. The Jets get more false hope because the Giants literally could not offense at all. What a disaster for the G-Man. What happened to the cojones you had in Buffalo, Dable? Why waste that outstanding defensive effort? Are you trying to get yourself fired? They're one step away from QB Sneaks on third and nine. How poetic. It's done. Yes, Mr. Frodo. It's over now. One bad game is a fluke and can be ignored. Two bad games is a streak and needs to be acknowledged. Three bad ones in a row is a trend and requires deep concern. The 49ers have a lot to be worried about. And there's no place to directly point the blame. It's everywhere. It may have taken a while, but the Bengals finally played up to their full potential for the first time all year. Joe Burrow looks fully healthy. And that's a joyous occasion for all of Cincinnati. He made the Niners defense look foolish repeatedly. And despite their early struggles, they have re-emerged as a threat to the AFC. San Fran, however, has serious dilemmas. Despite going on and clearing concussion protocol, Brock Purdy is in a sophomore slump. He went from rocking his cock out to shriveling back to Mr. Irrelevant with some of these throws. Do you see this? This is shit that would get a man benched in the XFL. You sure he's okay? Since he merely had to stand there and let the offense keep fucking up. San Francisco had chances to get back into the contest, yet since he refused to make mistakes, California sinks into the ocean with a decisive win. There is some positive news, Niners fans. You may have lost your third in a row, but Christian McCaffrey maintained his touchdown streak. I won! Although meaningless victories are still victories. Baltimore continually frustrates me with their inconsistency on the offensive side of the ball. They have the potential to dominate their opponents like they did last week. But with each new slate, it's as if the Ravens run a hard reset on their servers. For whatever reason, Baltimore just did nothing for most of the game. Lamar couldn't get anything going. The receivers couldn't separate from a weak secondary. Their attack had to be dragged out of mud by a Gus bus. I don't understand how they can just look completely lost for entire games. You better be treating that defense to a high-end steak dinner for the bailout job they put on today because they were the main reason the Ravens won anything. It is their third straight win. And I'm probably being too harsh on them considering the travel they've had to do, but once again, it's out of concern. I know what they can be. And if they can be consistent, great things could come. Arizona too, but they're just waiting for Kyler to come back. The Cardinal rule only overcomes Dallas. 
The streak of dominance must continue. Patrick <coughs> Mahomes has the flu, and he will rival Michael Jordan's performance under the weather and become a legend. Little did we all know the Michael Jordan he chose to imitate was the offensive lineman. That dude sucks. And so did the Chiefs. Against one of the worst defenses in the league, the offense held the entire team played as if they had the flu, exposing many systemic and lingering issues that have been hiding in the shadows for weeks. The receivers can't get any separation besides Kelsey. They drop a ton of crucial passes. They over-rely on Mahomes pulling off parlor tricks to win games. Endless chances to do something? Too bad you'll get five turnovers on a Broncos offense that eventually breaks the defensive dam. One of the biggest upsets of the season occurs where everyone is in a daze. And the Chiefs have a performance that harkens back to the Romeo Crennel days. Many streaks have ended in this humiliation. The 16-game win streak against Denver is over. The 13-game win streak against Go. divisional opponents is over. The confidence and elitism over most of the AFC is over. All that's left are the Broncos injecting themselves with endless IVs of hopium. Brandon Perna is already long lost. Pray he recovers from this horrible indignity. Deshaun Watson is a man under fire. He's out yet again, and accusations are flying across the board. Does he have the passion to play through his issues? Is he more injured than the Browns are letting on? Is P.J. Walker just the better quarterback for them right now? At this point, all I know is that Seattle's pouring it on Cleveland's defense to start the affair. It's a nice breath of fresh air for an offense needing to finish drives, but the Browns aren't too far behind in their attack. They'll rattle off two TDs of their own to make it a three-point game. And now the dogfight will commence. Defensive stalemates. Interceptions by Geno Smith. Cleveland imitating Seattle by being unable to finish the job in the red zone. Even when Geno throws another pick to the waiting hands of a Brown, they can't fully capitalize on it. Remember these goal line stands by the Seahawks. They'll be notable later on. Time will tick down in the fourth quarter. But neither offense can muster up much besides burning a bit of clock. Here is where Cleveland has the chance to upend their opponent. We're headed to the two-minute warning. All the Browns have to do is gingerly walk the contest home and a win is there. Pressure coming from Adams. But that's batted, and it is picked off! So why the hell is Cleveland throwing on a 33? They were controlling them on the ground. They had it won! And those ambitions were knocked away by Jamal Adams' helmet. Of course, this is when the Browns' defense runs out of gas and Geno rallies the Seahawks to escape from hell. Smith, screen, Jackson, Smith, and Jaybuck looking for the lead and redemption for the Seahawks offense! Touchdown, Seahawks lead! You call that a tragic Browns loss? That's nothing. This kind of devastation is Wednesday for them. It's tough to swallow, but Seattle jumps out of the building before it explodes. They fly away to the promised land of the NFC West Division League. The hell saw this coming three weeks ago. Seattle's making a push for the postseason, and they need weapons on defense to keep up with San Francisco. Unfortunately, they can't face the Giants every single week, but they can take a piece from them to help out. Leonard Williams is now a Seahawk. They had to give up a good bit to get him, but New York's eating a ton of his remaining salary. So that explains the increased draft capital in return. The G-Men get rid of an unneeded part, and the Seahawks get an upgrade on their D-line. It works for both teams on paper. If Brandon Staley loses this game, it has to be Quaker instant firing for him, right? Against this Bears team, it's domination or bust. The fortunate thing is that Chicago chose to unleash their disorganized, poorly coached unit out onto the field today. Witness such amazing feats of offense like barely being able to move the ball and making Tyson Bajant look like an undrafted Division II rookie. Their defense fared little better. Liquid LA was out here running checkdowns for most of their plays, and they ran untouched for gobs of yards nearly every time. Herbert was dicing them non-stop. They scored on their first five possessions, pretty much killing the Bears where they stood. All this does is make me want to laugh at the Raiders even harder. You lost to this? You made this look competent? What the actual hell is wrong with you? This team was outmaneuvered at every turn by Mike McCoy 2.0. Now they survive and gain momentum in a must-win game. See, Las Vegas, this is how you take care of business. The near-weekly humiliations of the Raiders have led to turmoil in the locker room. An open room meeting was held to wear out frustrations, and most of them should be pointed right at McDaniels. Fortunately, they get alleged relief in the form of Jimmy Jesus. He has risen on the third week of injury. Yet he is a Pharisee, a false prophet of terrible football. 
There will be no salvation for the Raiders. Thanks to the pathetic excuse of what they call an offense over there. I personally don't know how any team can win without Devontae, Jacoby Myers, or Michael Mayer catching the ball in the first half. Take notes from Detroit. My goodness, utilizing the talents of Jameer Gibbs when he's the hot hand? Holy shit, who knew that a team could be capable of such a breakout performance? Jameer's got a bright future here, but the score does this no justice. Detroit made a shitload of fuck-ups. They struggled early in the red zone, kept fumbling the ball away in key spots, and Goff inexplicably threw a pick six. In reality, the Lions should have won this game by 40. There was no contest whatsoever. And Max Crosby can be 95% of the Raiders' defense, it still won't be close to enough. Not when Jimmy G keeps airmailing wide open receivers, and certainly not when Devontae is absolutely livid at how things have turned out. He came here for Derek Carr, and now he's parked in hell. How do you fix this shit pile? Well, it's not Josh Jacobs' job to do. Feel for the players, but not for the team. You wanted to clone the Patriots and hire McSnake Oil? This is what you sow. The fact that Josh McDaniels is still the head coach of the Raiders after how predictably terrible he's been isn't the issue. The real one is wondering why the fuck the Raiders hired him and Dave Ziegler to begin with. Do they not see how much of a disaster Josh was in Denver? Oh, he slithered his way out of a Colts team he would have ruined? You're supposed to be surprised the Raiders have become a total gong show in a year and a half? This is a core feature of the McAsswipe experience. When will teams learn that skinning the Patriots alive without the core pieces doesn't work? I'm more shocked that Mark Davis finally had the balls to do what he should have done last year and kick both these hacks to the curb. The offensive coordinator's gone too, which isn't exactly surprising considering how shit it's been. This is something everyone who even glances at the NFL could have seen coming from a mile away. Big Ponzi scheme is a guy who shouldn't be anywhere near a coaching position. Yet he got continually carried by Brady in New England, so he keeps getting chances. What did cloning the Patriots get you this time? Three blown leads of at least three scores in the first eight games of 2022? What about the time they couldn't get past midfield against the Saints until the fourth quarter? Losing to Jeff fucking Saturday in his coaching debut? Baker Mayfield two days after being claimed off waivers? Kicking a goddamn field goal near the goal line with two minutes left down by eight? Being slapped around by the fucking Bears of all teams? Helping to run the starting QB out of town and pissing off the star wideout that came here for him alone? The man's learned absolutely nothing. Holy shit, what a fucking surprise. Don't worry, you can just sign former Patriots to fill the holes. Jacoby Myers has worked out, you know. This is gross incompetence. And honestly, him and Ziegler should be fired with cause for this shit. The team felt like it was on the brink of mutiny, for fuck's sake. Is this shit even a contest? When average schmucks know something's awful from the start, I think that's a sign you have no idea what the hell you're doing as an organization. I've said it since he was hired, and I'll say it once again. Should have kept Passaccia, Raiders. He was far from optimal, but you'd be a lot better off if you did. <coughs> Unit lost. Unit lost. Unit lost. Unit lost. The bloodlust of the football gods will never be quenched. Amen. week nine two coaches are off the staff is there a culture issue within your coaching staff absolutely not absolutely not you know so uh the culture uh, in our building is outstanding um the guys work hard every single day uh the relationship piece is there uh we care about each other and uh we're working diligently you know to get this thing turned